so today um, we're going to have a conversation of, um, here with um, Juan Yunus del Prado and we're going to talk about his teacher Don Benito and the reason being is that um, a lot of the teachings that will that Juan came from um, came through Don Benito not not all of his teachings but um, certainly the the start of his teachings in the Andean tradition and I've always found that fascinating and I've always found uh, even though I've never met Don Benito I've always felt this affinity with him and a connection and I'm sure that there's an awful lot of other Pacos that feel the same and um, I just want to really take this opportunity to uh, ask Juan some more questions about uh, Don Benito so we get to know him a little bit more. So Juan, um, would you mind just telling us how you came about meeting Don Benito in the first place? Well, I, I was making the academic research about the existence of the Pacos. And we make a survey about them and we found there were around 70 in Cusco. And uh, we discovered how there were a hierarchy and we decided to take a look of the people who were in the top of the hierarchy. And then the first person with whom we work was from Oscar Velasquez. And he was a living feel about the tradition. And only with what he told us, we can really uh, fulfill the request of the whole field research. But uh, the anthropologist has a behavior according which we are looking always for the most traditional version of anything. And Don Oscar was an, a, an acculturated person because he speaks Spanish and Quechua fluent. He studied until the high school, etc., etc., etc. And uh, we were looking for another person, more traditional. And in that time, I was deeply connected with Carlos Velaochaga and Esther Ventura. It's a couple. There were, uh, he was an anthropologist too. And he was a practitioner of uh, the tradition of Gurdjieff. And uh, when I arrived to Cusco, they were already working with Pacos for two years before me. And when I started to speak about looking for somebody more traditional, it's Carlos and Esther who told me about Don Benito and the existence of that man in WhatsApp. Uh, technically, they were who addressed me to, to Don Benito. Of course, I was looking for somebody more traditional, but they were working extensively with them. And this is uh, interesting. Maybe, maybe if you make a connection with Esther Ventura, you can have a version, a most traditional version, because they were working before me. And Esther has certain peculiar relationship with Don Benito with a certain extraordinary phenomenon around I never experienced. But if you if you meet her or talk with her, it's going to be very interesting. Another thing is she went into the school when the school was in Calla Cancha and she was able to meet Dionisio Machaca, who was the master of Don Andres Espinosa. Then you have a, a version which is going to be much more traditional because in that time, two years in advance were a lot of time because almost all the, the Pacos were in very advanced age. And so, and as a woman, I think <clears throat> she can offer you a profile which is more like you will for you. Can, can you tell me her name again? Sorry. Esther Ventura. He, he lived in, she lived in Lima and uh, uh, 
I'm not in contact now with her, but uh, I remember she has a business on your mm. Esther Ventura. Okay. She's an Argentinian. Mm -hmm. And she was uh, a practitioner of the Gurdjieff tradition too. Mm. Okay. It's see. interesting to know how these people were looking for the Andean masters because in... 1953, uh, one direct disciple of Gurdjie was in Cusco looking for having a connection with the Papos. It's Rodney Collins, is somebody relatively famous. For some reason, the, the followers of Gurdjie were interested in establishing a connection with the Papos. And uh, Esther and Carlos fulfill this, this, this thing. They were they make a deep connection. Right. So there was there was quite a few people like looking for something spiritual within the Andes. What this big connection was, and um, not just. I was not looking for for the Pacos. I <clears throat> I arrived to that conclusion as the result of the academical hypothesis. But the people of Gordon were looking for them uh, for the 50s, which means uh, they, they know better what they were looking for. Mm -hmm. And is there any, inform do they have like any research papers or anything that we could look at um, from? Uh, I think Esther was working with uh, a man who's Hector Ruiza and I think he lives in Paris, mm -hmm. and he wrote the book. Is uh, the Blue Flame is the name of the book. And it's a story about the meeting with the master in Cajacancha, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. I don't. I, I never read the book. Uh, I know the book exists, but I didn't have the opportunity of reading it. Yeah. And for you, it wasn't uh, so much uh, to get a spiritual connection, but you knew that there was something underlying that was happening from your research in your answer. Of course, in that time, I was not engaged with the mystical work. Mm -hmm. I engaged with that as a result of the first meeting with Don Benito. Mm -hmm. But they, the Gurdi followers, obviously were looking them because of the mystic knowledge. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if they have the intuition or they know something. Mm -hmm. 53 is very early. Rodney Collin was looking for that connection in 1953. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And for you, can you tell us again? I know I've heard this story a few times and I love this story, but um, your first time with uh, Don Benito and, and what happened when you went to his house? When I knew about them, and I went to the community of Wasau, was one morning of April of 1979. And I went with my translator there. And we make an offer. You know the whole story because we did an offer. We offer something to him. He invited, me, he invited us to go in the house. And uh, we were very direct. We were not trying to to hide ourselves or this kind of tricks which are used usually. And we went directly to him and we asked him, we told him how we are looking for him as a master. And uh, I think it's as a result of that how, how he make a show of his power. Because he triggered uh, something like a translinguistic way of communication. Uh, technically, he started to speak in tongues. In that time, I thought we were only a sign of the presence of the Holy Spirit according to Pentecostal groups. But now we know it's something more common and is uh, connected with certain state of consciousness. Uh, we found the answer with uh, Dr. Favro, is an Italian researcher about that, is neuro neuropsychologist, 
and he explained us how this phenomenon happened with, for some reason, two brains resonate. And apparently the brains become two net one of the other. We found that uh, just a few years ago in Italy. In that time, we didn't know that. But anyway, one thing is, if this kind of phenomenon happen in an spontaneous way, but I'm suggesting Don Benito trigger that, which means he was uh, beyond certain levels of mastery. Mm -hmm. This is uh, just to offer you a profile of him. Mm -hmm. He triggered the situation. Mm -hmm. And, and you knew then that um, that you wanted him to teach you more about this. So when did you then? No, start? I was just amazed for the phenomenon, mm -hmm. and I was doing an ordinary anthropological research. And in this first meeting, I realized something, and you can appreciate the impact of the man in himself because I realized how he made a show of his power. He used a way of communicating with transcend the linguistic uh, tool, go beyond that, and he made it on portable. And when I was coming out of his house, I realized that. And I realized how, yes, with my anthropological approach, I'm not going to really know what's going on there. Uh, and this is the moment in which I I realize what's necessary for me, if I want to know, to become a disciple of him. Can you imagine this is the the first connection with them and was very remarkable. And was really the opening of the whole tradition for us. Yeah. And you were like kind of blown away in that moment then? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he was trying to recruit me, <laughs> but he made just the show. Mm -hmm. And when I returned back, and ask him to become my master. It was like if he was expecting that because immediately he said yes and start to train me. Mm -hmm. And how often would you have gone back to his house for training then? Was it a regular thing? And would you have gone on your own or was it like, did, was there like a group setting with other Pacos or what way? Don Benito has a group of students. Uh, was me, uh, Pocha Balguet de Iglesias, was a mestizo woman of Cusco. Uh, later on, after after nineteen, after eighty-four, Americo Yavar came too. Um, uh, so there were three or four more students. But he has to uh, be there, and when we go, he starts to teach us. But uh, we didn't interchange the, the experiences. The only way to my interchange something is with Americo. But uh, when we interchange, we are not able to agree because he was receiving something different than me. So it's, so it's like you were all being taught something different at the same time. He was kind of look, looking at your, maybe your strengths. Or... What I think is he, he modeled the teaching to the kind of personality of the people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Recently, I was listening the granddaughter of Don Benito, mm -hmm. is Dilma, Dilma Venturo. And she was reminding me the master because she focused in listening. And with the people who go to look for her, what she tries just to have the opportunity of listening them deeply. 
uh, eventually they she invited the people just to take a walk to have the opportunity of allow them just to express themselves. And when I hear what she say, I was uh, recovering the attitude of Don Benito. He was not uh, focused in speaking. He was much more than anything listening to you. And then uh, after listening to you, he shows something. He makes something, an exercise, something like that. And then engage you and give you little explanations, but usually he teaches you with the example. To say, how I arrived to Samin Chakwi. He didn't teach me Samin Chakwi. What he did is perform a picture with the students and then I ask, and then he say he was inducing a Saminchakwi. Then I ask for what is a Saminchakwi. And then I arrive to formulate the Saminchakwi in the way I teach it. Okay. The same thing is with Saiwachakwi. We didn't start with that. He was just performing Hokariko, which is pulling up the energy with the student, and then explaining me how he was inducing something which is Saiwachakwe. Okay, but this is the way. Uh, he, he started with the concrete thing, and then if you are able to, to pay attention, he can direct you to a deeper explanation of the thing. Okay. Of course, if you just, just uh, see that you are going to stay in the in the Ojai or in the in the Kalpachi, you know. Another thing is, he was not about the speaking. Uh, in general, he was silent. Okay. And he was able to perform certain amazing things like Utiska. Did you hear that? Utiska is being inside yourself. Oh, yes, sir. Like you say, I am here. And then you can feel in certain way, I am not here. I am just totally inside me. Okay. And then after being there, she came out. Uh, the main example of this phenomenon is when I was trying to understand Huchamihu. Uh, I was trying to, we arrived to that in the usual way. You know? uh, I was asking him how he can deal with this bunch of heavy people with whom he deal in the council and how he is not uh, dragged down by them. And in the site, he mentioned how he was eating the heavy energy. I think the first thing, the first thing he mentioned is Mother Earth has the capacity to eat heavy energy. Then he mentioned he was eating the heavy energy of the clients. And then as a result of that, I realized how it was a technique of eating heavy energy. Okay. It's not high. But was not was totally discreet. The whole thing could be if you if you don't know how to go deeply, you can just stay in the surface of everything. Okay, and I think with much of uh, his students, it, it, this is exactly what happened. They stay in they stay in the pizza, they stay in the hokaiku, they stay in in the surface. And so, in the case of the Huchamihui, he was trying to explain me, and I, I was not able to, to understand. And he explained again, give me examples, and so. And I was so far to the, to the, to the procedure. Then he became totally utiska, he went totally in, and after the, the time he came out, and he came out, and he say, to 
do you have any stomach? And I say, yes, I do. Did you teach to your stomach to digest? I didn't, of course. Well, you have an energetic stomach too, and you are not going to teach your stomach how to digest because this was my my gut, you know. I was trying to do something to to teach my cosco to digest the energy, but uh, I I neglect to pay attention to the idea of the seed because the idea of the seed means you have the whole potential inside yourself. Mm. And you see? Yes. Well, things like that. He was not mysterious like the people tried to show the people, the spiritual people. No, he was normal. He was able to to deal with you in any terrain you, you can. He can engage with you making jokes or... He can engage with you going to drink a beer in the corner, things like that. Mm -hmm. Or you can just share with him a, a lunch uh, in his modest uh, food, etc., etc. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like sometimes when I see um, uh, Don Martin um, Kispe, that, um, that he would probably be similar to what... Uh, Don Martin, or sorry, Don Benito is like now, or was very it? similar. Don Martin, very similar. Yeah, yeah. There are a lot of people who deal with Don Martin, but Don Martin usually knows much more than the people think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if you stay in the surface, you are going to you have to get the surface of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So it's like uh, as far Don Benito was absolutely able to to perceive the level in which you are tuning with him. Mm -hmm. So if he can, he, he sort of felt or was allowing you to go within and then the teachings would come through your inner experience? In certain way, I would say he was able to see you. Mm -hmm. But see you as a, a deep perception of who. What are you doing? Or which level you are? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And where are the circumstances in which I I meet them who really take me to to go to grasp and recover what I did? Because I received a very strong training. I did a postgraduate in anthropology. And my master in this post graduate was an extraordinary person. And he really gave me a very deep training, which at the end was a mental training. And I think in certain way, the, the, the deep way in which I was able to go with Don Benito is the result of the training I received before with this man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and when we say that uh, Don Benito is like a, a, a master of the, the Yachai, um, but do you think that he also knew the Chaupi and Yoke as well? Um, but he focused more... Yes, to, uh, to, to give you a direct answer, I went to Cairo at the school mm -hmm. and I spent a month with Don Andres and of course I discovered the set of five cuyas. Mm -hmm. He teach me how to handle that. Don Andres Espinosa. Then I was, I returned back and I thought I was saying something new to Don Benito. And he just stayed quiet and say, wait a moment, he went in his studio and he took a set of cuyas and he said, are you talking about that? Yeah, so he knew all along. Mm -hmm. He obviously knew, knew the thing. Mm -hmm. Then there is another incident to reveal me how the master knew the whole thing. It's an incident with... Uh, Don Andres Espinosa. He has a disagreement with Manuel Quispe 
and he take from him the left side. This is the old whole thing I know, I knew. Then when I was able to to share the left side, because I don't know if you remember the mystery which was related with that. Uh, Don Mariano Apasa, the master of Ivan, supposed to be with us to perform that. And he already knew the whole ritual, which means in the school of Cairo, they knew the left side too. They knew the whole, but in certain way, uh, there were some people specially gifted. And Don Benito has the kindness to send me to learn with the top people in every uh, module, to say, of the tradition. Yeah. What I what you can see is the level of the mastery of this man, you know? She was able to regulate, which is the level of knowledge with which you can do first. Then he was able to send you, and she was not direct in that. It's like give you signs and you need to track that. But he put the, 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 super, the subliminal address, which allowed you to find the material by yourself. In the two cases. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm talking about something extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And do you think that um, with Don Benito, his uh, teacher was Don Julian Chayaco um, in his lineage? Do you think he would have had other teachers as well? Um, and, and with Don Julian Chayaco, was the teachings in Wasau or was that in uh, Keros as well? As I tell you, Don Benito mm -hmm. was not uh, looking to speak about anything you want to know, you know. He was not close, he didn't keep secrets. But he was not trying to spread the knowledge all over the, the planet, as some people like to do. And in this case, she didn't talk very much about himself. What I know is she studied with Don Julian Chayay. Uh, apparently, he looked for the master. And I don't know how they make the connection, but the master trained him. Uh, I meet some people who, who meet directly Don Julian, and they knew he was uh, working with Don Benito directly. This is one thing. Uh, the other thing is something which was revealed recently. He sent me to Cairo. And obviously he knew he knew about Don Andres and the place in which he was, but you remember how I arrived there, you know. It was like uh, following the uh, a trail or making a following something like Cheryl Holmes, uh, a send of certain signs, you know. He was not trying to make a mystery, but in certain way, he was trying to know if you are really interested in the pattern himself. Okay? Because there were a lot of people who come, but they were... They were not deeply connected with what they are looking for. And if... Jesus started to say, oh, there is a, a famous Paco in Cairo and his name is that and that. A lot of people are going to be to an, go to annoy Don Andres Espinosa. No. If you are looking for this kind of connection, he's going to send you. But you need to follow a track. Yeah, and it's... He, he, he was looking here? to know. Huh? It took you a year before you were able to go back and make that connection, wasn't it? Um, 
No, I I started in April, mm -hmm. and in August I was able to follow the train, mm -hmm. and I arrived to meet Don Don Andres the same year. I meet him in August. Oh, the same was, year as Don uh, Benito. Huh? The same year that you met Don Benito. Same year. Ah, the same year. Right. Mm -hmm. I engaged with him in April. Mm -hmm. And I was following the trail to Cairo in August. Oh wow! Right. <laughs> he gave me the whole, the whole puzzle. He showed me the whole puzzle, and I put. I was able to to follow it. Mm -hmm. And I did that with um, Peter Mueller. He writes a German anthropologist, and he write a book about uh, his space. He stayed in Cairo for a year. And this, there is a very interesting book, is The People of the Middle. And I think this is a very good description about the Kairos and his daily life and their what they do in a year. And it's the people of the middle, and the middle is the Chaupi. He found that, I don't know why, how. Uh, we meet them mature together. But my assistant and he apparently were not uh, interested specifically in following Don Andres because uh, Peter was a year in Peru and apparently he didn't return to, to take a look of Don Andres, but he knew he was the master of the school, etc. etc. Can you see how the the thing moves. In certain ways, it gives you a key to have a grasp of the character of the masters. Yeah. They were not preaching. They were not trying to engage you. Mm -hmm. They are not going to stop you if you really want to know. Okay? Mm -hmm. They are not keepers of secrets because uh, in the other tradition it's silly to be the keeper of a secret mm -hmm. because if, if you keep a secret of somebody the cosmos is going to keep several secrets of you base nine the people who try to show this as a mysterious thing in which they are discovering the secret 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 well it's not it is not so but they are totally discreet they are not preaching they are not making any propaganda about themselves. Well, this was in the ancient times. Because uh, they answer the concrete situation. And as a result of the new age, there were a lot of people who were trying to look for Pacos. Now you can say, see the Pacos having... Uh, advice about themselves they are even having uh, web pages and so and so because they found how this was a very practical way of earning life this is the reason of the new attitude of the Pacos. in the beginning nobody paid them for doing things like that and it it seems to be that um well, a lot of us, myself included, uh, you go for healings and uh, from these pacos. But you, I think initially, and I have to be honest about this, it was, uh, yeah, it's quite self indulgent. You're you're looking for some kind of something out of the world, out of this world. Usually, the majority of people who are up to the pacos were clients, and if you are a client, they are going to deal with you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> And then when you when you get a little bit deeper into it, you go, oh wow, there's like something really profound here that's happening. It's like there's something. something I, I, I give you an example about how you get the things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you need to be focused, and you have you need to have enough deep curiosity, and you need to have a systematic mind to to really go to the to the deepest part of the of the thing. Then Don Benito was a real 
Swede man. Uh, and at a certain point, he started to calling me Huawei, which is my my little children or something like that, but in the warm way. Uh, he was a very warm man. And uh, he, had, he was happy. If you take a look of the pictures you have, he's a happy man. And he was very poor, as you can see. Take a look. She is living in the middle of the poverty, but he was really happy. Yeah. Yeah, I love these pictures of him. And he was very conscious about who he was. He knew that. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about some of these pictures, especially that one that's of you? The, the first one is amazing because uh, was the middle of an interview made to Don Benito by Jose Acel. He was a reporter of the National Geographic magazine. Mm -hmm. And what he is doing is opening the cloud. Because it was a day which was not good to take picture. And Jose was looking to, he's, he's a photographer, a professional. He was looking for having a light. And Don Benito told him, okay, put your camera there. <laughs> and he started to blow the coca leaves. And some clouds open and Jose has the light to take the pictures. <laughs> uh, it's a series of three or four pictures, but you can see how the man is focusing something else. He is seeing something you cannot mm -hmm. to say. Take a look of the eyes yeah. and the attitude. And the other case is reading coca, but she is totally focused. He has an ecstasy. When he performs things, he's in that state. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. Here is she teaching, and you can see how he was totally focusing in what he was teaching. Okay? Mm -hmm. Then he was just sitting there in the side of the world, he was sitting with Doña Nati. They are drinking a little bit of aja, chicha. And he's just staying there, okay? Mm -hmm. In the other picture, he's reading coca, coca leaves. Uh -huh. And you can see how focused he, he, he is. Yeah. In the central picture, he's making, a, he's invoking the apus before reading the coca. And obviously, he's deeply connected with something you cannot see. Mm -hmm. And this one with you and him, what uh, what year, roughly, do you think that would have been? Yes, the one of you, you with him, um, what, what year do you think that would have been? 1979, 1980, something like that? I started with him in 1979, mm -hmm. and I was trained by him until 1987, mm -hmm. in which he gave me the initiation. And it was a journey, because uh, what I'm supposed to do is to learn to see. Mm -hmm. And every year I'm supposed to go to Coyuriti to see. And I was seeing there until I was able to grasp the meaning of the whole ceremony. Mm -hmm. And when I say to him, this is a Inca Pujay, which means the whole ceremony is an Inca ritual, he said, oh, you already see that? Mm -hmm. And give me a grade. But give me the second grade. Then he... Uh, he told me, now you need to take a group to Koyuriti and teach them what you see. 
And it, this is the, the way in which you can become part of the game. Mm -hmm. First, you need to be able to see. And see is not becoming a clear boy and is able to see the, the, rea the, the, the reality as the, as the reality is. Thing, it's seeing the things in the very measure the things are. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. This is seeing. And when you see, when you learn how to see, you become, you can start to teach, but not before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> can you see? Yes. Uh -huh. These are the, the traditional rules, and they are not speaking about that, but, but they allow you to teach when you already see something, when you have an overview of what's going on as a whole, then you are invited to take somebody to teach him, okay? Mm -hmm. They were interested in communicating. This is another thing. They were interested in communicating their, their knowledge, okay? Mm -hmm. But they want to, to communicate that to somebody who really can grasp the whole thing. Mm -hmm. They were not interested in, yes, in recruiting people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is the generation of Don Benito. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking about the old times. Yes. Take a look. I'm speaking about the last time in which I was is 87. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And can you tell us a little bit about Doña Anati and the relationship um, that Don Benito and her had in particular to the way they conducted healings together. Take a look of them mm -hmm. in the picture. What do you think about them? They just look so at peace and there's like a, some kind of real deep bond there with them. They are totally connected. You can see that in the picture. Mm -hmm. And she is happy, and he looks happy too. Yeah, they were a happy couple. Mm -hmm. They have a very high quality relationship. Mm -hmm. And they have their their own gifts, and they were able to respect the boundaries. Mm -hmm. She was an amazing seer. She was able to see a client go in the room and she knew exactly what's going on with him, okay? Without coca reading or nothing like that. Yeah. Don Benito was able to see, but she was able to see beyond Don Benito. Yeah. And, but... Her work is to see, but she's supposed not to make an interpretation of what he, she see. She saw something and she speak about what she was seeing, and Don Benito make the give meaning to the thing. If she start to give meaning to that, Don Benito was not so happy, and she can feel that. Okay. They have their their jobs and they have their boundaries. They respect each other. She was amazing choosing into very fast. In a few minutes, she can have 12, 12, 12 20 kindus. So, and this was her work. She chose the, the master throw the coca kintus. Uh, she chose the kintus for the despachos. The master organized the despacho. Can you see? And would she have had um, people come to her to look like like you did with Don Benito? Would there have been perhaps women that would have gone to her to? The students I mentioned mm -hmm. knew both of them. Mm -hmm. What is the, the kind of relationship they have with them? I cannot say because, of course, I knew her, 
but I cannot say she was teaching to me. She was not my teacher, okay? My teacher was Don Benito. We were interacting, of course, deeply, but she was not my teacher. She was not teaching me anything. And I suppose there were people who learned with her and uh, were their students and not the students of Don Benito. No. They, they have their boundaries, very clear, defined, and so. They, are, they were very organized. Another thing which is amazing is the discipline of Don Benito. To say, he performed healings twice a week. The other days, he didn't. He has say it's not possible. For my point of view, he was able to heal any other day. But he take this discipline to keep their privacy running. He was able to manage the whole situation. He was managing the whole thing. To say, now there is an amazing case and was reported by CNN. It's an Argentinian, a lady who in Rosario is healing a lot. But the lady loses his private life because of a hundred of people asking her to heal them. 90, 100 people making lines there. And it's a mess. With Don Benito, there were lines with only twice a week. And you can be asking him to do something for you because you are in trouble this day. No, no, no. The gift didn't work this day. That's it. Discipline. Because if you break your rule, you break your rule and you cannot go to restore the rule. If I receive the gift of a total healer, I'm going to be able as Don Benito. Okay? I'm not going to hide the thing, but I'm going to settle the parameters. Yeah, it's important to, to keep a little bit of yourself and your, your own life your own uh, personal life going on as well at the same time. So when um, when Don Benito passed away, uh, I remember you telling um, some stories about how you made connections or you've you had like a you could see him after afterwards. Uh, can you share a little bit about well, that? I saw him in two occasions. Mm -hmm. In the first case is, uh, I think he came to to encourage me to continue because when he died, I feel the path didn't have a meaning without him. And I decided to stop working. I put my mission aside, but once, I offered the ritual to some friend in the United States and he, he came to receive the initiation. If somebody came to ask you something you offer, you cannot say, oh, I am depressed. I cannot do it because I decide to. You cannot say that it's not fair. And I decided to play with him. And I performed the the ritual of the first day of the Hatun Karpa, which is the, what Don Benito shared with me. And in the first step is the cathedral. And in the cathedral, I feel like the dead was touching my nose. It's a metaphor. And my feeling was probably I'm going to die soon. And I was with another friend and I told him, you know, yes, in case something happened, you please told to my wife this and this and this, the, the usual things, you know. Then we arrived to the second place, Illapata, and he was in the site. 
And he was not looking as a ghost. He was Don Benito in himself, okay? And he was talking to me. He was making jokes about me, like always. And so when we finished the ritual, he vanished. We went to the third place. He was there. Finished ritual, he vanished. The last place, and he was there too. Okay, he was showing himself in the moment in which we were performing ritual, and then he just disappeared. This is one occasion. Of course, after that, I changed my mind and I decided to continue with the with the path. <laughs> okay. And then in another occasion, I was teaching to one of my first students. He's a North American. And we were performing a ritual in the cathedral. And he told me, do you see him? And he was seeing in the direction of the altar. I take a look of that, and Don Benito was there, was there. And was playing funny tricks with the, with the priests who were celebrating the mass. And we were able to see him together with my student. He sounds like he was a good sense of humor. Huh? He sounds like he had a really good sense of humor as well. Oh, Don Benito has the best sense of humor. Uh, did I tell you what happened when he, he and Don Major were playing with me and the heavy jokes they did about me? They too have a sense of humor. <laughs> Sometimes they were very, very heavy. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Oh my goodness. Uh, and so, uh, so I was going to tell you something. About the you game. asked about uh, if uh, Don, Don Benito has a training in Tero. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. We were with uh, John Parisi Wilcox, and we were working with Vilma, and he, she did a very amazing record with Vilma. But in that occasion, Vilma told us how his grandfather, his, her grandfather, uh, were in Peru for a while. But this is the old, the, it's Vilma who said that, not of Benita. And so he, he would have grown up in Warsaw then, rather than in Cairo? He was from Warsaw. Mm -hmm. That's what I know. He was from Warsaw. Yeah. yeah. And he, he grew up in Warsaw, and uh, probably he he met the master very early because he get married with uh, Doña Nati, and they get married very early. Yeah. Which means... Uh, he started to learn when he was a teenager or something, mm -hmm. or a young adult. Mm -hmm. And and did he receive his Paco training in any kind of like supernatural way, like being hit by lightning or anything like that? Or was it just... Um... Don Benito didn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, they explain how there are five ways mm -hmm. in the tradition. The extreme left is being struck by lightning. Mm -hmm. Then being trained by a left side teacher. Then being trained by a middle side teacher. Then being trained by the right side teacher. And there is an extreme right, which is connecting with the Hanachpachak Achia, which means the lightning, but not the lightning of Kaipacha, like the other but the lightning of the Hanachpach. And this is the mystical light. You can, you can make a connection with uh, mystical light, which comes from the heaven. And this is the extreme light. Fascinating. I mean, this has just been amazing. <laughs> I, could talk, amazing. I could talk to you all day long and talk about Don Benito all day long. <laughs>
But, but I, we, I will, we are focusing in, in the way you want now. For yeah, you. yeah, totally, totally. Is there anything else that you'd like to share before we kind of wrap this up um, about Don Benito or any of the other teachers? Excuse me? Is there anything else that you'd like to share before we finish um, this recording? Well, I think sometimes I I feel how was a tiny window which was open to recover the whole tradition because when Don Benito gave me the Hatun Carpai, he said there were 14 years in which they were not able to perform it. They were a team. And there were a large team, okay? But there were not enough factors of the fourth level, full development of the fourth level to perform the ritual. Then Don Benito and himself made with me two parts of the ritual. The first day in the day of Tipon, do you remember in the, in the, all the other things he has told me, okay? And this is something really, really strange. Don made with me everything, but he didn't say it was a series of performances. I realized that by myself. When Don Benito gave me the Hatuncar, by then I realized how what Don Mechor was doing with me was the Hatuncar left side. Okay? And then the third case, the Hatuncar by Chaupi, is not something Don Andres gave me. It's something he just gave me the parameters. And me and Ivan, we were researching for a long time. And finally, we were able to review the, the Hatun Karpai Chaupi for 2012. And it's amazing because Israel is a really a Munai Karpai. It's a, a deep connection with all the five royal couples, the imperial couples of the Incas. But he didn't take me to that. As you know, uh, I went a year to the school and I supposed to go the next year. I am not sure if I'm going to receive this ritual or another ritual. But the first year I received the, the factors who must be in the Hatun Karpai. And that's it. Because Don Andres passed away. 91, I supposed to go to work with him and I didn't, and in September, they announced me he died, okay? And so, in, you mentioned something here. You mentioned how this is a Gnostic tradition. Then, if so, what is most important than anything for you is what you perceive about Don Benito more than the things I told you. Okay? Yep. My memory of Don Benito is all the things I did, but my memory of him include the experience I have when he was on the other side. Yes. And this is very important. And this, in certain ways, is a key factor. Without that experience, I'm not going to be speaking with you. No. Yeah. Because I think I'd, I'd shared with you before that um, and I'm getting emotional now every time I talk about him. <laughs> uh, but when I, uh, I've shared the Carpi with my students, um, I've got quite emotional um, when I was calling in Don Benito. And it really feels like um, bringing in the whole lineage and especially him. So this is really why I wanted to have this conversation today to, to get a little, to a little bit more for me and an understanding of what that is that I'm experiencing because it's somebody that I haven't met before, um, but also to get to know a little bit about his personality and who he was. And this has really been so helpful with that. 
So thank you. And in a Gnostic approach, when we have an experience of somebody who's on the other side, mm -hmm. we take for granted we are taking a connection with them mm -hmm. as a real connection with them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then in the beginning, the Gnostic traditions could be a little bit confusing because every everybody is uh, having understanding which is based in, the, the, in their experience, but not only their experience, but their own prejudices we have or they have. But in certain point, the whole Gnostic procedure arrived to an integration. Why I can say that? In the last part of the Middle Age, were the Gnostic heresies in here. And there were a lot of people with prophecies, with statements, with teachings, with secrets, etc., etc. And was a little bit confusing. Okay. But in a few years, the whole thing become integrated in the person of San Francisco of Asia. And he is what reminds of the whole process. Can you see? As you say, because this is a Gnostic tradition, for today there are supposed to be several people who have different experiences, mm -hmm. including different teachings. Okay? Yeah. But the process is going to take the whole wave to an integration. And this is going to happen. And somebody, and I don't believe in chosen ones, but somebody is going to arrive to that. Mm -hmm. And the thing is predicted by the tradition. Mm -hmm. I think there's like the, it was the, the, the prophecy of Inkari, who was discovered by my father. Mm -hmm. Then was the prophecy of the three children of God. I pick up that from Andres Espinosa. But at the end, there is another prophecy. It's the prophecy of the emergence of the 12, the six Koyas and the six, in, the, no, the six Neustas and the six in Kamal. Okay? And this is related with centuries. And the tradition say, it's going to be a team of people of the fifth level. What's the meaning of that if you put it in a historical framework? Do you remember the apostles of Jesus? Mm -hmm. At a certain point, there were 12. And in Pentecost, they achieved the fifth level. Mm -hmm. The prophecy is saying a group of people, like a new college of apostles, is going to rise. Can you imagine the phenomenon? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Usually we say yes and you read this and these other centers in the 12s. But take a look and take the, the prediction and a little bit serious. They predict the first step of the integration and they predict the last step. Because after these six couples, one couple of enlightened people are going to come. This is going to be the synthesis. You are going to have somebody like San Francis of Assisi, Assisi or Claire of Assisi, a couple who is really in the top. And this is going to be the, the synthesis of all this wave of Gnostic phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And I'm not speaking about only the Andean tradition, because if you take a look of the whole New Age phenomenon, it's a wave of Gnosticism all over the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which means very close to the medieval Gnostic heresies. And the whole thing is, is going to be united. But the amazing thing is how the tradition predict that. They grasp which is the way in which the, this kind of phenomenon arrived to an end. Okay, mm -hmm. they don't 
say in abstract what is going to happen, but they they tell you they are 12 who are going to emerge, then they are going to meet in the Huiracocha temple, and then another is going to emerge. They are describing a phenomenon, like a phenomenon which happened in the, at the end of the Middle Age and end in San Francisco of Assisi. If you take a look of the people of that time, without any doubt, San Francis of Assisi, Claire and Frate Jacopo di Seppi Sole, these three guys were the top of the whole thing. And they were the synthesis of that. If there is somebody who get really close to Jesus Christ and his power and behavior is in Francis, mm -hmm. you cannot find another saint with this character. Well, <laughs> yep. Well, it just so it does feel like we're we're heading in the right direction with this anyway. Definitely with the with the. Well, the... I'm, I'm telling you this only to show you mm -hmm. the quality of the people to whom we receive that. Yeah. Because. Somebody told the myth of Incari to my father in 55. Don Andres Espinosa gave me the, the story of the three children of God. Okay? And this is the key of the Taripai Pacha. The three children of God are the Incas, the common people of the Andes, and the Westerns, us, including us. Okay? We need to play a role. And of course, in a certain way, it start to happen as a result of all the people who start to pay attention to the Andean tradition, Western, okay? Then, Don Benito made the last prediction, the 12th century. And this is a level of knowledge which is astonishing how they knew how the thing is going to happen, how they knew the contemporary situation is going to reproduce something which happened at the end of the Middle Age. They didn't know that. I can't say that because I studied the Middle Age and the Gnostic heresies and what happened, and at the end I grasped how the whole thing converged in San Francisco of Assisi. And I think there is no discussion about that because St. Francis is the only Western saint which is considered a bodhisattva by the Tibetan tradition, okay? There are a recognition which transcend our civilization. Well, I think we'll, we'll wrap it there. I think this is this has been as usual so incredible and it was just that's just perfect to end with the the prophecy and um I just have a lot of hope for our future the future of mankind if we can really get um get over ourselves and have the collective come together in that way we can achieve so much so thank you Something which is amazing is how these people were very precise. Yeah. All of them were looking for the fifth. Mm -hmm. But all of them knew they didn't arrive to that. Mm -hmm. Can you see? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, good news for us is we are in the same situation that them. Yeah. As far as I was not able to heal every disease in every circumstance, I cannot consider myself a fifth level. And nobody can do that. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are people who speculate about receiving teachings of somebody who was in this so so level. But this is just chit chat. You know? If you really take this tradition in himself, it's amazing. Yeah. Because it's not room to speculate about yourself. Mm -hmm. It's not about believing you are the chosen one. You are not. Yeah. But you know we are, you are doing something which is meaningful for you. 
can uh, give you a, another quality of life, which is very important. Mm-hmm. And even if it's only that, for me, it's enough. Yeah. Because it's a superior quality of life, you know? Mm-hmm. I'm living the best time in my life. I have 78 years now. Mm-hmm. But this is happening in the last 30 years. Every other year is the best year of my life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll 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 wrap it there. I'll just say thank you so much once again, Juan. And we'll just pleasure. Thank you.